I start off my talks by asking people to raise a hand if they believe that they deserve to be treated with dignity and respect. So I'm gonna ask you, and I'd like you to follow along with me, all right? So look straight ahead at me, and I want you to raise your hands if you believe you deserve to be treated with dignity and respect. Raise your hands. All right, all hands go up. Good response. No one volunteers to say, pick me. I'm the one who doesn't want to be treated with dignity and respect. I'll ask you the second question, and this time I want you to look straight ahead at me. Don't turn your heads. And by the way, if you're live streaming, you think about this. Raise your hand if you treat everyone with dignity and respect. Raise your hands. All right, most hands go up. Some people are being honest and telling the truth, saying, oh, I could do a better job. And somebody in here knows somebody else. And they're saying, I know he didn't raise his hand. <laughs> I know she didn't raise our hand because the reality is this, that we all want dignity and respect, but we don't all treat each other with dignity and respect. So this becomes the challenge because most people don't wake up and say, today I will not treat anyone with dignity and respect but we don't wake up and say, today I will. This is the challenge that I give to you. It was August of 2008 and I moved to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I moved from Los Angeles to the Bay Area, from the Bay Area to Philadelphia, from Philadelphia to Chicago, and it was August and I was in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. As a part of relocation, we need to find a place to live, and so I thought that would be fairly easy. So I went downtown, my husband and I walked up to the building that we decided that we wanted to see an apartment, and we rang the buzzer. We rang the buzzer, which generally is supposed to let you in, but in this case, when we rang the buzzer, what do you think happened? Absolutely nothing. So we waited a few minutes because, you know, the economy was in an interesting place at that time. And so we figured perhaps the person has taken a short break. So we rang the buzzer again and nothing happened. We went next door then to grab a sandwich and we said, perhaps we'll call and see if someone answers. And so I called using my inside voice. Hello, my name is Candy. My husband and I are relocating from Chicago. We're very interested in seeing a unit in your building. And so they said, sure, please come by. So we packed up our sandwiches. I said, we'll be there shortly. We're literally right next door. We pack up our sandwiches. We go next door. And what do you think happened when we rang the buzzer? Absolutely nothing. And so I called again, using my inside voice. And I say, hello, it's me again. My husband and I really would like to see an apartment. Are you showing apartments today? Oh, we're so sorry, please ring the buzzer. We rang the buzzer and this time they let us in. We go in and we say we want to see a two bedroom. They said there's no two bedrooms available. My husband said, well, can we see a one bedroom? They said, well, the one bedrooms are nothing like the two bedrooms. And my husband in his noble voice says, we will see the one bedroom. <laughs> we saw the one bedroom. Well, what they didn't know is I had a colleague who lived in the building. And so because my colleague lived in the building, I knew what the two bedrooms looked like. I was just trying to convince my husband this is where we should live. You should know that when we build these big units downtown and places, we don't like make unique units. They all look the same. They all have the same kitchen, the same bathroom, the same faucet, right? Everything's exactly the same, except the only difference between the one bedroom and the two bedroom is there was no hallway to the second bedroom. So we go downstairs, we fill out the paperwork, and we say, well, how do we find out when a two bedroom is available? And they say to us, call on the sixth of the month. This is exactly what I did. On the sixth of the month, I call and I say, hello, it's me again trying to find out if you have a two-bedroom available, and they say, oh, we just took someone off the waiting list. The feeling that I had in that very moment started a movement for me. Because in that moment, the moment that I felt this thing in my stomach, I felt it in my head. And they said, are you there? And I said, yes, but I think I need to go. Because the conversation I have with you on the phone is one that's very different than the one that when I'm in person. And I'm not sure what it's all about, but it doesn't matter. I think I need to go. So I walk down the hall and I tell my colleague the story who lives in the building. And 15 minutes later, they call and they say to me, Hi, Miss Castleberry Singleton. 
we have a deal for you. There's a two bedroom that's vacant. Now, in all fairness, it actually is being rented to someone. They just don't live here anymore. And we're just collecting rent. But I'm glad to say that I bet if we call them, they will allow you to take over their lease and then you can start your lease when there's ends. Now that probably wouldn't have been a great idea had they offered that to me the first time that we came to see the apartment or perhaps when I called that morning at 9.15. But at this point, the feeling that I had in here was not a good feeling. But for me, it started this movement this movement that's called dignity and respect, because what I learned, and by the way, I have to say that there are now more diverse people living in the building, and you should also know that Pittsburgh is becoming more diverse. But the three things I learned was one. One was that when you're in an interaction and you don't feel respected, you won't always know why, but the feeling is still the same. And when you're in an interaction and someone is treating you in a way that you don't feel that you're being respected, it actually is a personal choice that they're making in their interaction with you. It's a choice that we all get to make. So one is that we have to think about respect and how it affects our individual reputation. And that's the reason why some of you could laugh when I said, I know she's not raising her hand. Because we get to make choices. And it's our choices that created our reputation. And that's why it's funny to some. The other is, is those choices affect the way that we think about an organization because, see, we don't know where it starts or where it ends. We don't know if it's a personal choice that the person is making or is it the culture of that department? Is it the culture of that organization? Is it the culture of that community? Is it the culture of that city? We don't know where it starts and where it ends but it creates a reputation for an individual, but it creates a brand for an organization because we don't know where it starts and where it ends. So that's the first thing. The second thing that I learned is that it really is a personal value. And in fact, it's a choice that we all get to make. It's a personal commitment that when I interact with others, I will treat them in a respectful manner. And the third thing I learned is it actually is a higher standard. It's a higher standard for interactions because what it allows us to do, right, is to have positive interactions with others because we've decided that regardless of our difference, I'm going to be respectful. Now what we know is that the world is changing and as a result of the world changing, the world changing, there's an opportunity and in many cases, the very high likelihood that you're going to interact with someone different from you. And as a result of this, you can see many commercials today where not only are they embracing that, which we sort of have a box that you have to check, but they're embracing their full ancestry. You can send off your information and back comes your full ancestry. And as a result, people want to embrace not just the box they're required to check, but they're also one to embrace their full ancestry. And as a part of that, I would suggest whether you check a box or don't check a box, you want to be treated with dignity and respect for your whole self. The other is that we know is that these changing demographics are also affecting politics. Yeah, politics. The two things we were always told to never talk about in public spaces were what? Religion and politics, but we're gonna go there for a few minutes, all right? <laughs> Religion and politics, because the reality is is that politics today are creating a divide in our communities. Not only are they creating a divide, but it's creating to some degree civil unrest in local and national and global fronts. But the reality is is we are going to have to learn to interact with people who have di different political views than us. And if the second thing we weren't supposed to talk about, if the first was politics, 9-11 changed the conversation about religion. And in fact, today, religion is probably a conversation on the tongues of many of us. In fact, it's on our thoughts and minds, our hearts, and everything we do. The thing we should know about faith is as strongly as I feel about my faith, you feel about yours. And as strongly as you feel about yours, others feel about theirs. But in our everyday human interactions, 
I would suggest that people want to be treated still with dignity and respect. So from 20 years of sort of doing work around this concept of driving cultural change in organizations and communities, this is what I have learned, that differences are barriers only when we allow them to be. See, this is a choice that we get to make. It's a choice that we get to make that I'm going to allow your difference to be a problem. Now, what I can say is that most of the time these differences come from what we call filters. Filters are sort of the lens in which we see the world. And I see the world through my life experiences, through my work experiences, and the places that I've lived and traveled. And in fact, some of these experiences aren't even my own. They're stories that my parents told me. They're things that I've seen on the news. They might not even be a real example of what happened if I were in that situation. So let me give you an example of filters. Now, I want you to test your filters. You don't have to tell me what you really think, but this is gonna be an example that allows you to determine whether you have filters. And so I have a sister, she's a physician. She walks into a doctor's office and it's urgent care. So urgent care basically means it's not her patient, right? The patient doesn't know her, she doesn't know the patient. So she walks in, by the way, she's African-American as am I, she describes the patient as over 65 and Caucasian. And she puts her hand out to shake the patient's hand and she says, it's nice to meet you. And the patient responds, it's nice to meet you, but I'd prefer to have another doctor. Pause, filters. As soon as she told me that story, I said, oh, sister, I'm sorry that that happened to you. And she said, let me finish the story. She told the patient, you have two options. The first is, is I can put you back in queue and you can see another physician, but no guarantee the problem you have with me is not gonna have happen with another doctor because I don't know what the problem is. Or two, you can tell me what it is and perhaps we can work through it. Patient says, I have no problems telling you. You're too young to be my doctor. Now, how many of you feel a little sigh of relief? Yeah, I have to tell you, I felt relief too. But I will tell you how powerful filters are if we act based on what we believe without pushing pause to say, what else can this be? We can actually miss a significant opportunity to treat someone with respect. And so I have a colleague, he's Muslim. He walks into a room and another colleague says, you're not like the other Muslims. And he says, really, how many do you know? The guy says, zero, I only heard about you, right? Think about it, we all have this opportunity. So I'm gonna ask a few friends to come with me and join me up on the stage as we illustrate a point, and that is that there is power in the ampersand. Now the ampersand is a thing that I carry around, I wear it with me, and anybody who knows me well knows this is a picture from my office. Because what I know is, is that what I believe and what you believe may be different. But if we learn to collaborate, if we use the collective power that we have for me to lean over and say, what do you think's happening? I might get a different perspective. And if I lean over and say, what do you think's happening? I might get a different perspective. So if you thought there was power in the Wonder Twins, I'm gonna tell you there's more power in the ampersand. So when you and I and she and he, and he and he and she, and she and she and me stand together. We have energy, and that energy looks like this. <laughs> By the way, there is no special unique energy that we have. But as soon as one of us decides we're not into this, we're not into collaboration, all it takes is for somebody named Jasmine. Jasmine, are you on this circle? Put your hand up and let go. Jasmine has the power to activate the circle. Put your hand back, Jasmine. See, it's a trick. <laughs> By the way, the previous speaker, let's give her a round of applause and let's ask her to say, I'm not gonna step into this circle and let go. All right, Giselle, come back to the circle. Giselle comes back to the circle. By the way, all of us have the power to activate this concept of dignity and respect. There's power in collaboration. There's power and we all have it. So let's thank our participants. So there's some
some stuff happening in the world right now that I would say will be your second opportunity. Your first was the filters. This next thing is actually happening right now around us. Here's your opportunity. These are two different people who perhaps could do a little bit more listening to each other. But if we leverage the power of the ampersand, I would say that we have to remember that we're all in this world together. We all live in this city. We all live in this state. We all live in this nation. And imagine if we leveraged the power of the ampersand and chose to allow you to have a difference of opinion, but still be respectful in my communication with you. So that's the challenge that I give to you. This is the call to action. The Dignity and Respect campaign is all about creating a world where we treat each other with dignity and respect. We teach individuals to find common ground, to build cultural awareness, and to learn to work with others through their differences. And so now, I ask you if you'll join us. Because right now, today, this conference, this, co this day, this TEDx Pittsburgh is all about activation. And I hope you didn't just come to see us. I hope that you came because you want to be a part of activation. So if you're with me, I would like you to say, I will do my part. 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 I will do my part to make Pittsburgh and our world a better place for all to live with all of our differences. I will do my part. Will you? You've been given this day to use as you will. You can waste it or use it for good. When tomorrow comes, this day will be gone forever. And in its place was hopefully your decision. You can decide right now to activate respect. You've been given this day to use as you will. You can waste it or use it for good. When tomorrow comes, this day will be gone forever and in its place, something you left behind. I hope it is a decision to activate respect in your daily interactions. Frank Barron once said, never take a person's dignity. It means everything to them and nothing to you. Thank you.